we are building the fastest and lightest privacy-centric Ethereum layer two. We're infrastructure, so developers can build dApps on top of our network. Uh, we are an Ethereum layer two, so we enjoy one of the strongest ecosystems and, and security uh, around. We are an L2, so we're very fast. All of that is interesting, but I think the most interesting part is that we are privacy-centric. We are building what is called a confidentiality layer. It means that if I transact with you, the entire world can see that you know my address is sending something to your address, but they can't see what, and they can't see your balance and my balance. We are Token2049. I have the pleasure to interview Shahaf, the founder of Koti. Thank you so much for joining me. Could you tell me a bit more about yourself and your journey into crypto before we start talking about that? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Thank you for the time. Uh, I've been in crypto since uh, 2016. Uh, and founded Kodi at uh, 2017. Overall, I've been a tech entrepreneur in the last 25 years or so. Um, I'm pretty well known for starting a company called Web3 in uh, 2006. So that was pretty early on. Um, but yeah, been in Kodi uh, since inception. Uh, and happy to say that I grew the company with, uh, with an amazing team to where we are today. How big is the team now and how big is the company? So overall, uh, we are almost 100 people uh, in, in our group. Um, but I think that's, like, that's not the, the most important vanity metric. Like, I think the concentration of talent and hardworking people that we have is what matters uh, most. And could you tell me more about what you guys are doing within the ecosystem? Yes. So, you know, the, the, the boilerplate is that we are building, you know, the fastest and lightest uh, privacy-centric Ethereum layer two. So now that's a lot of words. So we're infrastructure. So developers can build dApps on top of our network. Uh, we are an Ethereum layer two. So you know we enjoy one of the strongest ecosystems and and security uh, around. We are an L two, so we're very fast. But all of that is interesting. But I think the most interesting part is that we are privacy centric. So. Uh, we are building what is called a confidentiality layer. It means that uh, if I transact with you, the entire world can see that you know, my address is sending something to your address, but they can't see what, and they can't see your balance and my balance. Because we believe there's a balance between transparency, which is something that we encourage, to lack of privacy, which is not what everybody wants, and it's actually illegal, to be honest. So the same way I think you would never use your credit card if you knew that whenever you swipe your card, people can see everything that you've ever done and they can see your bank account and they can see the store's bank account and everything. It's impractical in many ways. So will crypto be. So we think to actually live in the future where the internet is decentralized, and it's governed by protocols and tokens, there needs to be some confidentiality allowed on top of a public blockchain. And this is a problem that is not solved today on Ethereum or in any other uh, major L1. Uh, and you know, there are a um, few technologies that can actually do that. Uh, we are using, we are the first to use an innovative technology called Goblin Circuits. Yeah, before we move to that, I feel like there is a very fine line between the privacy and the compliance side. Sure. Uh, so where do you stand on it? Because some people might argue, on the, especially on the Web2 side, that blockchain enables illicit activities. They, they, they would argue that Bitcoin enables it. So now with privacy coins, their minds would be blown. Like, oh my days, now I can't even track it back to the, to the user. Um, so where do you stand on it? And like, how, how do you think it should be regulated? Sure. So for, there are a lot of good things that you've said here. So first of all, I think it's a, it's a popular misconception that you can do illicit um, uh, transactions on top of blockchain. It's actually the worst thing that you can do <laughs> because everything is kept on a public blockchain where everybody can see that. So use cash if you want to do illicit activity. <laughs> if you're going to do it on a blockchain, you will get caught it's eventually. It's all advice, yeah, no financial, no not, financial no, not, not, not no. advice at all. Fiat is dangerous, Fiat is dangerous, but um, public blockchain by definition is always visible and traceable 
and, and it exists forever in perpetuity. And there are so many organizations out there from governments to private companies that can uh, uh, do quite a lot of work on a public blockchain and eventually trace it back to you. Uh, ask the guy that founded Silk Road and, mm -hmm. and a lot of other criminal activities. So it's actually a very bad idea to do that on a public uh, blockchain. Other than that, privacy is not bad. Privacy is not for criminals. Uh, there's a good saying that privacy is normal. Privacy is why we have shower curtains, right? <laughs> uh, um, people don't want their, their entire transaction history to be visible. And businesses don't want their entire transaction history to be visible. And it's actually not just a good idea and how people actually feel about things. It's the law, right? We have GDPR and HIPAA in the US, right? We have privacy regulations that actually protect people from being surveilled, uh, from becoming a target, and you know, just for their basic right for, for privacy. So privacy is super normal, and it's for everybody. It's not for, uh, uh, for criminals, actually. So the way we structure everything is a bit different than, than what you expect. So you have solutions like Monero, Zcash. These are privacy tokens. Everything is anonymous. Anonymity will always counter regulation head on because it infringes the basic um, regulations like KYC, like know your client, who are you transacting with, um, and hence leads to money laundering, terror financing, and all of that. So we don't build that. And this is why it was delisted from exchanges, uh, uh, et cetera. What we do is allow users to have selective disclosure. It means that, yes, um, it's visible that I've made a transaction. I went last night to 7-Eleven. I'm not trying to hide this. But what I bought, right, and how much money I have in my wallet, and how much money is in the cash register, that is confidential. Unless I don't want it to be confidential. Or unless the rules in 7-Eleven is that every transaction that you do is visible, right? So if you have that layer, you can build far more interesting things in blockchain than what you can right now with everything being visible. DeFi, AI, like a lot of things become possible when you can hide or keep some of the things private. So this is what we are offering. And could you explain to me why do we need an entirely new blockchain as an L2 rather than just adding additional feature to a blockchain like Solana um, with like the advancement of uh, ZK, techno ZK technology, we can potentially do that. We're just like very early, early very early stage, uh, but some people might be able to implement that on other L2s that already exist. So they will just add the privacy component to it rather than having a completely new blockchain that's focusing on privacy. Well, first of all, it's important to note that we, um, there are some privacy solutions out there that are layer ones, essentially a new type of blockchain. Yeah. And I think that's the wrong way to go because then liquidity needs to move around, yeah. et cetera. That's always a problem to bootstrap something. We're doing something different. We are uh, actually uh, essentially an Ethereum layer two. So if you trust the liquidity and security of Ethereum, then this is the sort of trust that we have. So we're not actually uh, uh, encouraging a new type of blockchain. Now, it will be tremendously difficult, not just technically, but practically, to introduce all these changes to Ethereum. Think how difficult it is to introduce such smaller changes mm. in how Ethereum is, uh, is built. And this is why, you know, even Vitalik Buterin encourages L2s and encourages solutions that can solve certain aspects on top of Ethereum instead of just building the whole thing uh, uh, differently, right? Yeah. So, so this is actually what we do. Other than that, we, we are starting from a current chain that we have that, you know, that is already very liquid, listed everywhere, already has an FDV of about 200 mil. So uh, it's, um, we think we kind of like find the, the, the most balanced approach to um, how to scale this business. And could you tell me a bit more about the tokenomics around your blockchain and what are you guys planning to do there? Yeah, so essentially it, it resembles you know, a lot of other uh, chains out there in the sense of there is a certain uh, inflation that uh, incentivizes people that run the infrastructure, incentivizes people uh, that stake, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, we are going to have and we're going to introduce, and we haven't really publicly disclosed everything about this uh, at this point, so it's, it's one of the first. Uh, we are building um, a new node economy in our ecosystem. 
and it's going to be very, very cool. And, and, it, and it ties to the tokenomics because you know, those who run nodes, those who stake, et cetera, uh, will be the ultimate beneficiaries of um, the tokens that are minted to the ecosystem. Other than that, uh, we have a big fund that uses Kodi to encourage new builders and new projects. So anybody that is building a new DAP right now um, and is curious about what confidentiality can add to his DAP, uh, specifically, we see a lot of demand around DeFi, real-world assets, AI, uh, games, wallets, etc. So we incentivize these people as well as part of our tokenomics. Nice. And if I want to use Koti, do I need to have the? Do you need to buy? Do I need to buy the native token, or could I use my Ethereum and just run it through Koti? So you won't be able to see my Ethereum transaction. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. Well, depending on the use case, and that's that's super important. So one of the interesting things that we do, because I've done a private transaction on top of of Koti's chain, and now it's time to roll up, and it ends up on Ethereum, of course. So how is it not visible then? So we've actually solved that. So you can do everything on top of, of Kodi, and, and even when it um, propagates to Ethereum, it remains confidential. Oh, okay. And, and, you- and not only that, but uh, because we, uh, there was a big event for us last night, we launched our testnet. So we, we disclosed a few interesting things. One of them is that we are working on a cross-chain solution. So... In theory, you could do a transaction on Solana, and the part of it that you want confidential, you can send it to our network with cross-chain messaging, have that part be you know, in a back room and confidential, and then get back the calculation that, that you wanted. So we'll be, in the end, will be a cross-chain solution. Nice. And could you tell me a bit more about the road map and where are you planning to launch on mainnet? Because you announced testnet yesterday. Yeah, so testnet was yesterday, and you know, depending on the stability of it, etc., uh, we're we're aiming to launch testnet. Uh, sorry, mainnet before the year ends, and before that happens, we'll introduce two big things. One is the node ecosystem that I told you about, and the second thing is uh, cross chain uh, solution. So that will lead to mainnet towards the year's end. So it's going to be an exciting uh, uh, three four months ahead of us. Nice, that's really good. Uh, and what will be the main updates that will come with main mainnet? Are you planning to announce uh, any any more updates? Yeah, so we've uh, we've announced the the first cohort of uh, partners last night. Um, so you know, companies like uh, My Ether Wallet, uh, Unchain, Civic, etc., are all building on top of our testnet. Uh, and you know, we have a very strong business development team. Uh, and then, and so the other thing to expect is kind of like the business updates. So, you know, new partners starting to build on top of our chain. So essentially what we do is we work on researching new use cases that can use confidentiality. So for instance, we've realized that, you know, DeFi will always be limited because you can't do um, sophisticated trades like stop loss, et cetera, because everybody will see what you plan on doing. Or games, you know, <laughs> games are... On-chain games are ridiculous because everybody can, if you want to do poker on-chain, everybody sees your hand, right? So all these things we research and then we productize that and then we offer that to the market and onboard partners. So this is kind of like the cycle. So what people can expect is, you know, us announcing more and more of these use cases and partners uh, that are building. And could you tell me a bit more your stand on CBDCs? Because they're gaining popularity and I think the reason the security coins, I'm not security coins, privacy coins uh, have been becoming uh, more prominent within the mainstream conversation is because we have that push uh, from like governments to introduce CBDCs. Uh, So where do you stand on that? Do you think that with the introduction of more and more CBDCs, we'll see more people being concerned about their privacy? Yeah. So well, a few things. So first of all, uh, we are a part of a CBDC project that was announced, uh, I think, about six or seven weeks ago. Um, uh, the Israeli central bank uh, now has a uh, sandbox uh, where they're testing a digital version of the local currency. Um, so they've picked about 20 companies to be part of that sandbox. So that includes us, of course, but uh, other than that, then PayPal, Fireblocks, just to name a few. But we are the only a network in, in that sandbox. Um, so 
I think CBDCs, it's actually, um, you need to see how it's built, right? Not all CBDCs will be evil and not all CBDCs will be good. Obviously, it allows a government, potentially in theory, depending on how it's built, to you know, freeze your assets, right? But USDT and USDC are the same in that sense. You can freeze them both, right? Um, it allows, it may allow the government to surveil your transactions, but they can do that today with public blockchains the same way, right? So fully anonymous tokens, I get that, but if you are going against the law of the land, many, you'll, you'll lose many times, right? So how do you balance things? So I think if a government is to build, you know, a proper type of CBDC, meaning they don't control the whole thing. It's not just um, it's not just a Web two solution pretending to be Web three. It is the infrastructure is decentralized and public. Um, if there is private components to the chain, then the government doesn't have the keys to add to that. Trust is shared among all participants and not centralized through a government. So the sort of technology that we have allows for all of that to be as good as that. Now it depends on the government and the level of trust citizens have. But I think if, uh, you know, power is with the people, right? If, if the people think that this solution is corrupt and not good, then they're just not going to use it. They will use, you know, Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. So you see that, but you can see that, you know, even in, current, in countries where, you know, the citizens don't trust the fiat of their country, like Venezuela, then they move <laughs> to crypto as well. So I think people should vote, you know, with what they hold and what they don't hold. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts on CBDCs, why you're building within the Ethereum ecosystem. Such a pleasure to you. My pleasure. Nice. Thank right. you. Thank you.